Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Andrei Vaitenko, and I am a senior product manager at VMRay. Uh, today, we have a session that uh, will cover the new capability of VMRay, uh, which is a Sentinel-1 integration. So basically, the goal for the webinar is to speak about what value VMRay can bring to Sentinel-1 users. And uh, yeah, without further ado, let's get back to the agenda. We have it pretty packed today. Uh, firstly, we will speak about the XDR programs in uh, general. I promise not to give you another explanation of what XDR is, uh, but rather to speak about what sort of uh, correlation and what sort of intel you can get from uh, your ETL, from your XDR tools. Then we will switch on uh, how to, to, to choose the right sandbox for your XDR program. Obviously, that's a spoiler. You need the right sandbox if you want to be successful with your XDR. Uh, then we will cover uh, the structure and uh, the type of information that we provide into Sentinel-1 incidents as long as you uh, are a Sentinel-1 user, and I suspect that you are if you join this webinar, then mm, for not causing a death by, by uh, PowerPoint, we will have a live session, and uh, then we wrap up, and uh, there will be a space, time to ask the questions if you uh, have them. So yeah, let's get started. So first of all, uh, since this is the webinar about Sentinel-1, I will use the screenshot from Sentinel-1. And uh, let's speak a little bit broader, a little bit more uh, general, like you have this XDR program in place. And uh, you have an incident on the endpoint. Some thread was found and mitigated. And uh, the report says everything is OK. What are the uh, typical next steps for your XDR program? You probably will look for some enrichment. You will look, uh, you will reach out to your uh, directory service to grab more details about the user, like his name, uh, his login attempts, and so on and so forth. This can be either from directory or from theme or from wherever. You will go for the theme for all kinds of logs that are related to the nodes and maybe to the user. You will uh, ask identity protection products. If you have identity protection products, like uh, what do you know about the user in, in, in question? Was he involved into something? What's his, uh, let's call it the credibility ratio? You will query uh, network detection and respond tools. And all of this should be done automatically, of course, because this is an XDR program. You, you, you want to remove the pressure of the manual effort from the shoulders of your analysts. So uh, XDR should query its, its, its network detection and response part with the question, uh, was the node involved into some suspicious activities? Maybe there were some lot moves in the networks. Maybe uh, the node uh, really tried to reach out to the internet to some suspicious C2 address or maybe something else. Uh, if there was an email that was the source of the uh, malicious file or user tried to download it from the uh, gateway, you can like really query an email gateway or web gateway with uh, what exactly uh, was it? Um, who was the user? What was the session? Where uh, did it download from? What were other attempts uh, to reach out to the internet uh, by this user or by this AP or something else? Uh, so basically, what I'm trying to say is you will try to get the broader context of this detection. Who was involved? Um, what were the previous steps? Are there any other detections that cause the same correlation? The, 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 are there any other alerts that can be correlated with uh, this detection and so on? At the end of the day, you can reach out to TIP and ask like, uh, do you know like what? Do you know the hash sum of the file that was detected and quarantined? And that's basically everything you know about the thread at the moment when it is stopped by your EDR component of the of the XDR program. Because you simply have 
the hash file and you don't have anything else. But there is a big piece of information that is missing and that you might use and that you want to use probably if you want to uh, get like even more information about the incident. And the piece I'm talking about is uh, the piece that is related to uh, to answer the question, what would happen if the attack would not be stopped? What if this malware keeps going on? Would it encrypt the hard drive? Would it try to reach out to some C2 address? Would it try to download some uh, malicious uh, payload? Would it try to encrypt something? Would it try to reach out to the next nodes in the network to, to make some LUT moves? You do not know nothing about the soul. And uh, if you don't go the next steps, if you don't try to replay the attack, you are losing this part of Intel. And this is highly important as well, because uh, all these IPs, all these hash sums of the files that are downloaded and so on, you can use this Intel to correlate within your broader context as well. So basically what I'm trying to say is your, your XDR program will only be complete if on top of having a broader context of the incident, which is highly important and which is why we have the whole XDR things in place at the first place. You need to have a deep context of the incident and uh, that will help you to uh, get even more intel about the incident, to uh, react even faster and even more reliably. And uh, yeah, the question is what tools can get you this deep context about the incident? And the answer is obvious. It stays around for many years already. The answer is a sandbox. Uh, and uh, more or less every big security vendor at the moment have, uh, has their sandboxes. But the question is this, if sandboxes are around for so many years, why when everyone is speaking about XDR, they, they don't put the sandbox as like a corner product for the success of the XDR program? If all this extra information is so important, why we don't uh, hear this like every day from every source. And the reason is that basically uh, sandboxing technologies, the previous generations and sandboxing technologies, uh, they somewhat uh, had some issues, some challenges, I would say, that stopped them from being a reliable source of enrichment uh, for other tools. Uh, and uh, there are like three pillars, three major drawbacks of the previous generation sandboxes that every every like senior security analyst will tell you if you uh, grab him around the corner and uh, push to the wall and ask this question. The first one is evasion. Malware knows about sandboxing technology. Malware tries to evade the sandbox and that's what we see every day. So in order to be a reliable source of information for XDR, you need to be able to keep up with evasion. Uh, you, you need to beat these attempts to uh, detect that uh, the malware is run within a sandbox. The second one is a huge amount of false positives that the sandboxes are usually associated with. Uh, also, bad intel, like bad IOCs, uh, and huge reports. What I have on the screen, 91 page of uh, of A4 paper, uh, is uh, a report that uh, one of the publicly available products has produced on an empty Word document. So when you choose a sandbox, that's by the way is very important. Uh, don't try to just submit something bad and see if it is detected and how it is detected. Try also to submit something good because every false positive counts. Every false positive is your time, uh, interrupted business services, and so on and so forth. Don't stay just on the negative side of the things. Uh, check also how reliable the intel is. Like, are you really capable? Like, are you capable of uh, trusting this intel or not? Like, can you trust this? Because bad behavior is bad behavior, 
And having as many IOCs as you can is not always good. There can be some publicly available uh, IP addresses there because uh, some of the services like Word uh, has uh, come out to get some updates. That's something that can happen within the uh, within the uh, file analysis, and uh, then you what? Then you have Microsoft IP addresses as IOCs. Then you send them to the block list, and uh, then no one in the company can get updates anymore. This is what may happen if you trust like bad Intel as well. Alternatively, you can submit file to the sandbox only manually, check everything manually, read this long reports uh, and do this in a separate console because uh, that's what many sandboxes do as well. Uh, so the, the next pillar here is an integration effort that you need to spend to, uh, to integrate the sandbox into your XDR program. Because usually when something is included, when something is a part of the existing uh, program that is delivered by a vendor, uh, these sandboxes are pretty often uh, prone to uh, to the pillar one and pillar two, to evasion, lots of false positives, bad intel, and so on. Because for for uh, many companies, uh, sandbox is just a checkbox in a long list of products. So really think about uh, the integration effort that you need to spend to integrate the sandbox into your environment and the analyst experience. Because if to get this data on enrichment, analysts need to leave the console and go to another console and uh, made several clicks there. Now, how much time will it take? Uh, will he always remember that he need to do this step or he might forget about that? All the things are pretty important as well. And uh, yeah, since I am from VMRay, I need to tell you that we don't have these uh, drawbacks. And this is true. Uh, we have reinvented the whole sandboxing technology. Uh, we uh, have a unique hypervisor-based architecture, which basically means that uh, we uh, do not have any presence within the machine, within the uh, within the operating system, where we where we analyze the file. That's why we can't be detected. On top of that, that's why we can stay on top of the uh, whole machine and uh, watch sample execution from the first moment until the end. And we have full access to uh, the machine uh, disk space. We have full access to the whole memory of the uh, machine where the sample is executed. And that's why we can concentrate on watching just the sample behavior without watching all the rest of of the of the uh, life that is happening within the operating system when the sample is running and that's why many other products are so noisy they don't have this uh, um, hypervisor based architecture the second reason why vmray is very much different is uh, it has vtis which are vmray threat identifiers which are in essence uh, behavior markers that can tell you that the sample is doing something unusual. We have separate VTIs. We have chains of VTIs, like your seam has correlation chains. We have correlation chains of VTIs as well that allow us to detect even malware that stays very, very low under the radar without delivering any false positives to the uh, customers. So the second pillar for us, the second reason why we are different is uh, these VTIs that gives us the possibility to uh, provide in-depth and complete analysis of the sample that is being executed. The third one is noise-free. Since we are able to concentrate on uh, malware behavior and just on malware behavior, let's say sample behavior, do not accuse sample uh, until we know that it's bad, we can concentrate on sample behavior. Uh, we do not have all the extra information about the operating system functioning. We uh, don't care about if Microsoft Word has decided to go out uh, to get some updates by itself, if this behavior is not caused by the sample in question. So we will simply uh, not uh, spam you with wrong, uh, with wrong intel. So our intel would be different. Our intel would 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 be reliable, and it is reliable. 
and we will see this in the demo. Finally, we are ready to be used at scale in all the automation projects. We uh, have amazing scalability. We have amazing API and uh, we have amazing connectors. And one of them will be demonstrated in a couple of minutes. Uh, yeah, this is just to give you an example on how important it is to uh, beat evasive malware. There is a malware family which is called Bumblebee. Uh, that's a malware loader. And uh, we are watching the family for quite a while already. And uh, what we see that there were different variants, uh, different stages within the evolution of the Bumblebee. And uh, the project itself started some while ago. However, in March 2022, it didn't perform any any evasion checks at all, any checks to beat being spectated. Uh, then suddenly in uh, May 2022, there was a variant with more than 35 evasion techniques. And these evasion techniques usually include the questions like, uh, what's the memory size of, of the uh, machine? What's the disk size? Uh, are there any VMware tools installed or virtual box tools installed? or something like that. Uh, is the user present? Uh, how fast is the user moving his or her mouse? Uh, and so on. Then suddenly all the checks disappeared again. And in January 2023, there were like more than 50 techniques. Again, we are prone to this kind of things for two reasons. First of all, because we have a uh, hypervisor-based approach, that's how the second generation hooking, uh, the, the second generation sandboxes will be uh, presented in the eyes of the evasive malware. It checks for the presence of different services. Is it checks for different debugging tools? It checks if some APIs are being hooked and so on. Uh, and if it finds that. Uh, some of these things, some of these checks are not passed it will simply stop execution. Unlike second generation sandboxes that you see around a lot, VMRay is different. And uh, where exactly VMRay is different in, again, in how clean the machine is, how clean is the operating system, the environment where the sample is being detonated. We give all the right answers to the questions that malware ask and we do a huge job to give these right answers. Uh, we give the right answers about the size of the hard drive. We give the right answers about uh, the amount of uh, memory. We scroll the document when we see the document. We click on the dialogues when there is a dialogue uh, and uh, so on and so forth. So we, we really pay attention to beat evasive malware we do this for almost 11 years now, and we are very much good at it. Now, there should be a moment in place where I should tell you, I mean, not me, but where someone who should have joined me would tell you how great Sentinel-1 is, because Sentinel-1 is good. Sentinel-1 is an amazing product. Uh, one of the reasons is that Sentinel-1 really remains open to third party products integration like us. And uh, that allows Sentinel-1 customer to get amazing enrichment, not from us, but from some sort, sort uh, from other best of breed products as well. Uh, but I don't have a colleague from Sentinel-1 here today. So yeah, let me do this myself. Sentinel-1 is a great product and the combination of VMRay and Sentinel-1 allows you to get better enrichment, allows you to get uh, fuller, um, more full, uh, deeper context into the incident. And uh, that's why this combination, Sentinel-1 and VMRay uh, really provides you uh, all the information you need and uh, allows you to uh, get uh, the context of the incident and uh, uh, the intel associated with the incident much faster in a fully automated fashion so that you can respond faster, so that you can get extra, extra intel faster, 
so that you can stay more uh, protected. Speaking about this integration that you will see in a few moments, uh, we built in uh, the uh, connector to Sentinel-1 into VMRE product. So basically what the connector does, it queries Sentinel-1 on a periodic manner uh, on what threads were found in uh, Sentinel-1 XDR uh, platform. Uh, then it downloads all associated files, all files associated with these new threads, the, with, with these new incidents. Uh, then we do uh, dynamic detonation analysis, uh, and uh, yeah, we provide the intel on uh, all of these samples, and then this intel is shipped back into Sentinel-1 console. Funny enough, I'm from VMRay, but my demo today will not include showing you a lot of VMRay console, rather uh, I would concentrate on the Sentinel-1 part. Uh, in VMRay, we will only see how to uh, configure the connector, that's it. And enrichment that we provide, includes, first of all, verdict. Because sometimes you're unsure. Sometimes your analysts are unsure. Like, is it good or is it bad? What's the right answer? And we give this right answer. We tell this is good or this is bad. And then we give a threat name, threat classification, how we see this. And this is something important as well, because once the file is detected only due to behavior, you might be missing like, OK, uh, now it did that. But is this all bad behavior or not? What's the whole threat? What's the bigger threat? If the file was just accessing the process of the, the, the memory of the neighbor process, uh, what would be the next step? Maybe at the end of the day, it will start encrypting something. But you don't see this part because the uh, detection and determination of the process was behavior based and you already saw bad behavior, but you didn't see again the full extent of this bad behavior. So threat name and threat classifications are very important for incident prioritization. Then you see what exactly behavior markers have triggered. Uh, what was the bad behavior that the sample uh, has demonstrated? Uh, that's pretty important because uh, when we see new analysts, especially new analysts that work with VMRay, that work with VMRay within uh, their XDR environment, they uh, pretty often cite that uh, it was easy to understand why exactly the file was a threat. They didn't hesitate at all. We were so clear with the explanation that they made this informed decision without any doubts, and uh, they start trusting the sandbox, they start trusting this integration even more. Finally, we ship into the console the IOCs that uh, come with this analysis, including the IOCs that are extracted from the malware config, if, if of course, there was a, a config for this malware. But enough of PowerPoint, let's switch to the demo part. It's too early to wrap up. I need to get to the demo first. Uh, please let me know if you can see my uh, browser. Yep, thank you. All right, I promised that I will not show you our amazing interface uh, because we are speaking about the integration and what value will you have in your Sentinel-1 part of the uh, play. Uh, for this, I will just show you how to configure the connector. Uh, being a, uh, being a uh, user admin account, you need to go to the analysis, then to Sentinel-1 connector. We have a separate and special button here. And uh, then, as you see, I already have one created. So let me open this one. Uh, the configuration is pretty straightforward. It takes you like three minutes maybe to, to, to do this all. You need to give it a name. Uh, you need to enable it. If you want to enable it, then in case you are a Sentinel-1 user, you definitely know the URL, Sentinel-1 URL that you use to log into the system and also to access this system via the API. Uh, the next step is to provide the API token to your 
uh, system with the rights. And uh, then you need to decide what exactly samples do you want to submit to VMRay. These can be uh, only malicious samples, for example, or malicious and suspicious sample. Or you want to submit all of the samples that Sentinel-1 has marked somehow into VMRay to get more intel of them. There are use cases basically for malicious only. You want to have enrichment, malicious and suspicious. You want to have enrichment and uh, and validation. Uh, and even in A, like something, something went wrong. We, we want to get more details. That would depend on your risk appetite. That would depend on, uh, yeah, again, like what use case do you consider? Then as I said, uh, the connector will reach out to your Sentinel-1 instance on a periodic matter. Uh, by default, it's 10 minutes. In my case, it's two. You can test the connection. Some of the customers asked us to provide the possibility to limit the quota to uh, limit um, the number of submissions that the connector can actually perform daily so that overall quota of VMRay is safe. Uh, we did that. However, again, uh, on what we see, Sentinel-1 is doing a pretty good job on whitelisting things, and usually they don't have uh, false positives. Uh, so I would say it's even safe not to enable it. Having done all this configuration, you click save and you can start using the connector. Basically, you don't need to do anything else. You just relax, go to your Sentinel-1 console and wait for it. Uh, how the whole enrichment will look like? That's a, it's an incident page uh, that contains the enrichment from uh, VMRay already. And uh, we provide, we ship our enrichment into the uh, nodes section. So basically, for all the detections that were made by Sentinel-1 in just a couple of minutes without any manual actions, that's a pretty important step. No, no actions are needed at all. Uh, you will get, first of all, the verdict again, like I said, malicious. In this case, malicious. Uh, you will get threat classification. This is the spyware. It tries to steal something probably, but let's see. You will get the threat name from ourselves and also from several uh, technologies that we use within the product. You will get all of them uh, because we believe that shipping you with the right threat name is something really important. Famous behavior markers I spoke about, VTIs, uh, will tell you why exactly we thought that this is malware. Of course, there are a lot like high level VTIs that uh, simply tell that, um, where is it here? Uh, we were able to extract the configuration of the agent Tesla family from the sample. So this is definitely malware. This is definitely agent Tesla. And even the Intel includes uh what exactly uh, was within the configuration intel is down below iocs are down below but also we will uh in 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 case this is not agent tesla uh and we still tell you that this is a threat you can take a look and really see why we thought that's a threat because it tries to get your sensitive browser data because uh, it tries to get your sensitive mail data, which means your user name and the password. Uh, because it tries to get your browser data. Uh, but also because, for example, uh, it's here, it tries to modify Windows Defender configuration. Like uh, if there is a Windows Defender on the machine, this one, for example, uh, tries to create exclusions for some folder so that Windows Defender doesn't look into this folder. So it's an evasive malware in a way as well. Uh, and uh, even without being able to see that this is Agent Tesla, if we don't have this config in place, we would still be able to uncover bad behavior and will still be able to present it to you and explain in a human language why the sample was something bad. And finally, we ship the whole Intel list here, all the hashes of the samples, all the hashes of the samples that were downloaded 
by the sample if there were some downloads, all the reach outs that were made by the sample, and so on and so forth. All this, again, will appear in the console in, in a fully automated fashion. You don't need to do anything to get this. And uh, that's the beauty of the of the connector. You, you spend three minutes to configure it. I, I would say 30 seconds, but you need to get a, an API key for Sentinel-1, which takes time sometimes. Uh, and uh, that's it. Let me wrap, start wrapping up the webinar with uh, key points, key takeaways. So the takeaways uh, here will be these four. First of all, uh, your XDR program is not complete without a sandbox because sandbox is a key point in getting a deeper context, not broader context, but a deeper context of the incident, and that's like vitally important for any XDR pro for any successful XDR program out there. The second one is that uh, hooking sandboxes, previous generation sandboxes that use API hooks, they are susceptible to evasion uh, because hooking can be detected. They produce a lot of noise because they cannot distinguish between bad behavior and uh, something that is done by the operating system. They just watch all the requests to the APIs. So they produce a lot of noise and thus a lot of false positives as well. Don't look only for detonation. Don't look only how good your sandbox is against bad files. Take a look on how good your sandbox is against good files. Because if you want to automate your sandbox experience, you need to trust it. You need to know that it will tell this is bad against bad and this is good against good. Doesn't produce you any false positives, especially if you consider automated response, like uh, blocking some IPs or uh, DNS names or uh, users. Finally, VMRay is a reinvented sandbox. VMRay was built more than 11 years ago to help you to fight unknown advanced threats with automated malware analysis. Uh, we do this for 11 years, for more than 11 years now. And uh, we concentrate on bringing you value, bringing value into your XDR program. And that's why we have all these integrations, easily set up integrations that include today Defender, CrowdStrike, obviously Sentinel-1, you saw this, Carbon Black, Chronicle, uh, XSOR, Splunk SOR, uh, Torque, and you name it, and most probably we have this integration. So if, if you like the demo, but you want to see it yourself once more, uh, you can go to the uh, guided tour that we have on our website at uh, www.vmray.com slash integration slash Sentinel-1 minus partner. Uh, on top of that, not alternatively, but on top of that, you can go to the vmray.com slash try minus vmray and uh, get yourself a free trial version of the product.